I've assembled this collection of artifacts, posters, visual supplies. There's Timothy uh, in 1962 when he first started to lecture about LSD. He's still wearing his Brooks Brothers button-down suit. And there's his first record album, Turn On, Tune and Drop Out. He gave lectures at Town Hall. Then he toured giving psychedelic celebrations on use of psychedelics. He ran for governor in 1969, 1970 against Ronald Reagan. That post was put out before he was in prison. Probably known in human history. It's collected his paper archives the way I have. And all my wives have been pissed off about it. Timothy had two children and four or five grandchildren. And he was, uh, you know, very much beloved by his, by his family. And a godchild. And he had a godchild, uh, Winona Ryder. Uh, the, the film actress whom he met as a little girl and who he agreed to be godfather to and they they became very close this is charlie rose at the age of 25 winona ryder is one of the top actresses in america today she happens to be my daughter we were very very close and he was my godfather like a normal godfather he took care of me he never gave me drugs he never did drugs around me he um, did he ever tell you not to do drugs no, he talked to me about it. He, he took the mystery out of drugs, certainly. I mean, they were like a big yawn for me because everyone, everybody was, doing everyone was doing them around me, so I, had, I never had any interest in them anyway. He was a, a great dad in, in really every sense, um, even you know the really traditional, very American sense of what a father is supposed to be. You know, We played baseball in his backyard. He took me to the baseball games, the video arcade. We had some shockingly domestic situations most gentle, funny, kind, wonderful man, and, and we, um, we were very close, but we would do things to it, like he would take me to Dodger games, and, and uh, he would tuck me in, read me stories, really, really took care of me. Um, it wasn't this big party scene that people tend to think. I mean, I was around that a little bit, maybe a couple times, but he was very protective of me. We would discuss the Leary family, and I was talking about how um, the Learys were similar to the Kennedys, and he just got outrageously angry. He said, we were the first Irish Catholic family to have money long before the Kennedys. We're better than the Kennedys. And I, I would kind of chide him, and I'd say, well, you know, at least the Kennedys kept their money. The Leary family <laughs> doesn't seem to have any of their damn money. Then he would talk about the family and how brilliant the family was, and then he paused. My favorite sentence ever from Tim, which was, um, yeah, the Leary family were brilliant really fucked up, but really brilliant. <laughs> Timothy experienced uh, the tragedy of his first wife committing suicide in the 50s, leaving him with two young children. In the case of Marianne, his first wife, I definitely think that's a case of, of bad luck, of a, a chemical balance that just was not happening. The death of his daughter Susan, uh, you know, in his words, were, was the saddest event, most heartbreaking event of his, of his life. He had his bad days, he had his, he had his down moments, and he didn't always give all the right attention to the right things at the right time, so there was a lot of chaos in Timothy's life, and you know, that sometimes caused problems for people around him. In love with his children, but like all heroes, perhaps, rather negligent. Timmy really always looked at his, uh, at his losses and his, his pain as, you know, new walls and barriers to jump over and, and climb. You know, he was really such a strong and brave man. Timothy was such a, a famous, notorious public figure that a lot of people don't realize that he was a writer and a man of letters and a researcher, and he published over 25 books, beginning with these psychology books uh, when he was at Oakland in the 50s, and then he went on to Harvard. Dr. Timothy Leary takes up his part of the tale of the tribe in a Mexican hut and brings his discovery to Harvard. That is not the only way in which we can get a measure of achievement motivation. This business game, for example, was especially designed for this purpose. You will again have to make a decision on how many... When I was a psychologist, I was one of the first, there were others too, to tape record, or in those days a wire record, believe that. <laughs> Uh, interviews with patients. Now most psychologists did not want to do that. You know why? They didn't want other people to know what they, what they were doing. It was actually, it was unheard of. So 
psychology and psychiatry was secret and you kept the files. And the, the patient couldn't see the files. We introduced a, a group therapy. So instead of a almighty doctor, <clears throat> there were the so-called patient. They become quite enthusiastic. My God, your aggression score went down uh, in, in the last month. But, but oh no, you got pretty aggressive right now. You see, they were, they were using these scores. Not to say you're a bad person or anal neurotic, but they were just scoring each other's behavior, you know, practicing so. In this particular situation, the players are to construct rocket planes. Each player has to estimate how many planes he will build during the time allotted. What is your decision? I'll take five. I think that sounds pretty reasonable. I'll take six. Were you contented with the way it was being done at that time? Well, I'm never content. I always saw we could improve. Yeah. I, I, I think I'm the happiest person that ever lived. And I'd love to be proved wrong so you could show me what your trick is. No, of course I was enjoying this with the frontier of, of philosophy and psychology and who are we? Yeah, yeah. I was very happy. I think what happened to Tim Leary that uh, turned him from being a uh, West Point trained potential Harvard professor uh, and certainly a Harvard guest lecturer into uh, the acid guru was that he made a trip to Mexico and a friend of his in 1960 and a friend of his convinced him to try these little mushrooms that were supposed to be magic. I was in Mexico and a friend of mine, a university professor from Mexico University, came by and he told me he had the mushrooms. And I talked about it, and he talked to me about it, and I talked to some of the Indians about that. And said, yeah, sure. So I took uh, the Mexican mushroom, so-called, uh, in Mexico, I think it was 1962 or three, I don't know. And had this incredible experience. Well, these were magic mushrooms, and magic mushrooms are very much like LSD, people who've taken consciousness-altering substances Part of the trip of LSD, I mean, if, if you take it at a dance, maybe it's fun for the dance, but in real life, most of us who use these substances realize that we're using them to confront ourselves, to confront our fears, to confront what we like about ourselves, and to reassess who we are, where we are, and why we are. Well, first I would say that every second of every LSD session is different. There's no, it's like every second looking through a microscope is different. It depends what you're looking at and what magnification you have. The first reaction typically was to laugh. You would laugh and laugh at laugh at the pomposity of the mind or the uh, pretentiousness of psychologists to think blah, blah, blah. You just laughed, you know, liberation. You know. Here's what happens. When you take LSD, it's as though you go down the barrel of the microscope and you are literally swimming around with your own cells. What's actually in them? I mean, these, these tiny little chemicals that, you know, trigger some things in your brain. Um, but uh, what's really in them is the power to completely transform yourself, to kill your ego and start all over again. Colors and forms which are continually changing in rhythmic pulsation, the pulsation of the heart. A time is completely gone because to your cells, your cells have never heard of the 20th century. Yes, I just laughed and laughed and I knew that uh, I would never see my mind the same way and I'd always have a you know, outside point of view there. He made a joke about it. He said, you know, the university is the guardian of the academic establishment. They are transmitting the accepted conventional worldview. You can't expect them to transmit some knowledge that it challenges the conventional worldview. He says, to expect a university like Harvard to sponsor psychedelic research would be as unreasonable as to expect the Vatican's to sponsor research on aphrodisiacs. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's not their job. One of the great lessons for most people when they use LSD, one of the things they learn is we are all the same. It's one energy. It seems to be one of the messages LSD gives you. The energies that you run into when you take LSD, the visions that you get are not supernatural and they're not pathological. These are ancient biological messages which are stored in your nervous system and in the cells of your body. I think his initial insight with the mushrooms, the Mexican mushrooms, where he saw that the mushroom experience was a recapitulation of the entire evolutionary process, I think was a brilliant and, and totally original thing. Nobody had ever done that. People had always interpreted it in religious language before. Nobody had never had the language of science to interpret these visions. It was really showing that the language of science is identical to the vision of the, of the core spiritual shamanic traditions all around the world. 
in uh, 19...